And the book of Joshua, we talked about this numerous times, and, and as I share with you, I hope that you will open your Bible. Basically, you're going to have to open your Bibles, or turn your Bibles on, to four, four pieces of Scripture today. First, we're going to start in Joshua chapter 24. We're going to be in Joshua chapter 24 for a little bit of time, because I only have a little bit of time, because uh, we're going to do communion, and then of course we're going to have our, our papa. But Joshua chapter 24, we're going to be talking about the covenant renewal, and how Joshua renews the covenant with the people of Israel. Um, they have an opportunity to... You know, I, I, and I love the last part of Joshua chapter 24 because Joshua calls him out. He just says, you can't live up to this. <laughs> and he makes that statement. No, they go, oh, be, be, a, be, be a witness to us that if we don't do what you say, that this comes upon us. And it does. Because they don't. Um, Joshua renews that covenant, and there's the famous statement, you know, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And, uh, and, and, and in this passage of Scripture, Joshua renews that covenant, and then the next chapter it says, you know, he dies. That's his last, that's his last word on the matter. And um, Joshua, if you, read, if you haven't read the book of Joshua, I encourage you to read the book of Joshua. But the book of Joshua is incredible because Joshua actually means the same thing in Hebrew that Jesus means in the Greek. And Joshua is the, the, the typology, the, the, the picture of our, our Jesus, our Savior. Because Joshua leads the children of Israel across the Jordan River and into the Promised Land. And that is what Jesus has done in our life. That's what the uniqueness of those people in that time with the covenant relationship they had with God and God choosing to go ahead of them and to fight the battle and to give them rest. Jo Joshua leading them. God has, has also, through Jesus Christ, taken us across the Jordan River and into the Promised Land. And the covenant we have in Christ Jesus is... What makes us different? It's what separates us. There's a there's a difference. There should be. <laughs> I mean, uh, there should be a difference in the way you act. There should be a difference in the way you talk. There should be a difference in the way you live. There should be a difference in the way you raise your children. There should be a difference in the way you conduct yourself in marriage. There should be a difference in every single facet of your life because you are a part of a covenant. A covenantal relationship, a greater covenant even than those the children of Israel were with God in that covenant relationship. That He He fought for them, He took care of them, He led them, He guided them, He He did everything for them. He gave them rest in that covenant. And see, this covenant relationship that Joshua has, and he renews it, and it says, Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders and the heads of the judges of, and the officers of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to the people, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates. Terah, the father of Abraham, and, and of Naor, and, and they served other gods. What we see here is Joshua is reminding them of the, the, the monotheistic uh, principle that they are to have as a people, that there is only one God. And he says, then God said, then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river, and I led him through all the land of Canaan and made his, you know, his offspring many. I gave him Isaac, I gave him you know, Jacob and Esau, and I gave Esau the hill country and Sierra to possess, and Jacob and his children, they went down to Egypt. And then, then he talks, you know, he, re he remembers the captivity. Joshua is about 110 years old, I think, here at this point, and he remembers what it was like to make bricks. He remembers what it was like to be in slavery, to be enslaved to a, a captor. 
And he says this, that, and, and then he said, God said, I sent Moses and Aaron and plagued Egypt with what I did in the midst of it. And afterward, I brought you out. Then I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and you came to the sea, and the Egyptians pursued your father with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. And when they cried to the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians and made the sea come upon them and covered them. And your eyes saw what I did in Egypt. And you lived in the wilderness a long time. Then I brought you to the land of the Amorites, who lived on the other side of Jordan. They fought you, and I gave them into your hand. And you took possession of their land. And I destroyed them before you. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, the king of Moab, arose and fought against Israel. He sent and invited Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not listen to Balaam. Indeed, I, he, he blessed you instead. So I delivered you out of his hand. And you went over the Jordan and came to Jericho. And the leaders of Jericho fought against you. And also the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hittites and the, and the Gergesites and, and, I, and the Hivites and the Jebusites. And I, a lot of heights there. <laughs> You know, I feel I wake up in the morning and I got ice all in my shoulder, ice in my knees. And I wonder where these ice come from. There they are. And I gave them to you into your hand and I sent the hornet before you. God used the hailstones as we talked about last week. And I gave them into your hand and I sent the hornet before you and then drove them out before you. And the, the two kings of the Amorites, it was not by your sword, I love this, or by your bow, I gave you a land on which you had not labored and cities that you had not built. And you dwell in them, you eat the fruit of the vineyards and the olive orchards that you did not plant. And see, with God, I'm not going to read the, 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 the continuum in this uh, because I'll let you do that. I want to move quickly. But God showed them He established this covenant and He kept this covenant. Now, what I want to do for a second is I want us to just take it now and I want to trans kind of go forward hundreds of years to a moment. Um, I'm not going to go all, I mean, I'm not going to cover too much of like uh, Bethlehem, but what was born in Bethlehem was our Savior, a great high priest. A great high priest. Now, if you want to, I'm going to challenge you to turn your Bibles to, check, to Hebrews chapter 8. What I'm attempting to do this morning is I'm attempting to say, what is the big deal with Joshua? And why did we study him this summer? Because I want us to learn from Joshua what we should know about Jesus Christ. And that is, he is our leader. He is our he is our our deliverer. He is the one who has led us into the promised land. And here's something that I don't quite grasp a hundred percent, but I am learning, and I want you to begin a journey of grasping this. But he has come into our lives. To give us rest. You know, so many of us struggle, so many of us burden, so many of us are, are overcome with grief and with guilt and with shame and with with, with just a, a an overwhelming sense of, of emptiness. And God has no desire for that in our lives. God has a desire for us that we experience Him and we experience Him and rest. That we rest in Him. That we trust in Him. And Hebrews, the first seven chapters, comes down to this point. The whole book, and I don't want to go and re, completely redo, I don't have enough time for one thing, but I don't want to take you all the way through the journey of Hebrews. But and if you want to, go and read the book of Hebrews because what you're going to see is a very parallel New Testament book with the book of Joshua. And what's going to happen is Hebrew writers are going to bring you to a point, and, I, and 
Then I'm going to take a little diversion. You might circle this or write it down in your Bible. John chapter 6. Or the whole Gospel of John. Because the whole Gospel of John is incredible because you have John the Apostle who is the writer and he is taking us and he is writing every moment piece by bit, piece bit by bit. And he's showing these typologies and he's saying in, in, the, in the Passover, Jesus is greater. John chapter 6, he said, you know that bread that you, your, that manna that your, that your fathers had, that was, that would go into your bellies and then it would be gone or it would lay on the ground and it would destroy you. But I am the bread of life. He who, he who eats of me never will ever be hungry again. Jesus tells, John goes through and he teaches, he's better than the Passover. He's, he's, he's better than all of the festivals. He's better than the temple. He's better than the priest. He's better than Moses. He's replaced them all. And then it comes down to the book of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 8. And it says, now the point is what we are saying is this. And you kind of go, you know, awesome. Somebody's come to a point where they're going to say straight up. He says, we have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. A minister in the holy places in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus it is necessary that this priest also have something to offer himself. Now if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all. See, that's what, this is, if, this is, I love this. If he were on earth, he wouldn't be a priest at all. Since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy, a shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he meditates is better. Listen to this. Since it enacted on a better promise, Listen to this. For the first covenant had been, had it been faultless, if for the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. And I'm going to continue to read this whole chapter. He goes, For he finds fault with them when he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant. And so I show no concern for them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds, and I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. I love this. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I, or, uh, I'm sorry, for, for they shall know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. And speaking of a new covenant, listen to this. He makes the first one obsolete. <clears throat> And what becomes obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. See, Jesus now, this, this covenant that Joshua is reestablishing, this covenant that Joshua is leading his children of Israel into the, into, to, to the promised land, is now passed away. And God has sent a new covenant in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now then, you can turn your Bibles, if you would, to Luke chapter 22. And I just thought it would be befitting to bring this close to a point in our, in, our, in, our, in our hearts where we see that God began this work in Abraham around 2160 B.C. in the Ur of Chaldees. In the heart of a polytheistic, pretty wealthy people who had ziggurats, 
He had probably many household gods. His life was surrounded with spirituality. Abraham was probably not a spiritual, I mean, not lacking in spirituality. He was probably a very spiritual leader. And God spoke into the life of Abraham and began a covenant people who were separated, who were different, who were to be pulled apart from the world. And he chose Abraham that the eventuality of things would lead to the point where Abraham himself would father the chosen one of God who would bring peace to the hearts of people, who would bring knowledge of the holy to the hearts of people, whose new covenant would be in his own blood. A sacrifice that need to be made no more that covers the the need that covers the sins of people forever. Those who accept the payment of that sacrifice. One of the neatest things I've had the opportunity to teach one of my children was just lately. I taught one of my children. He had, he had committed the act of lying. And I could tell that his soul was grieved over his act. And he was seeking forgiveness. And in Christ Jesus, he is in Christ Jesus by his own testimony. I said, the glory of this, my child, is this. That the God of the universe through his son Jesus Christ has already provided forgiveness for your sin. Before you ever committed the act of life. And in Christ Jesus, you are See guys, that's rest. That's peace. That's a peace that passes all understanding. And here's Jesus speaking. Or here's Luke speaking. It says, when the hour it came, he reclined at the table of the apostles. This is Luke chapter 22, verse 14, I'm sorry. And, and when the hour it came, he reclined at the table of the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat the Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again, or eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And gave it to them saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, This is this. This cup is poured out for you. Is the new covenant in my blood. You see, God's new thing that He was talking about, that new work, that new covenant, is about to come to fruition that next day in the sacrifice on the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. That blood is going to be shed. That cup symbolizes that blood. That cup symbolizes the new covenant. That bread symbolizes the broken body. That bread symbolizes the covenant of God working in our lives. God taking care of us. Working in our lives. Ministering to us. Giving us rest. As we get ready to take the Lord's Supper, and I want to transition now to that ministry. But I just want to give you an opportunity right this moment. Every head bow. Every... Every part focused on Christ Jesus. But I want to ask you this. Sincerely. What does it mean to you to be a person
person of the covenant. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, what does it mean for you to be a person of the covenant of Jesus Christ? I'm going to tell you, Paul says not to take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. I think the heart is the centrality of the issue. What is my condition in my heart? Both vertically and horizontally. I believe my relationships dictate so much in my life, dictate so much in who I am, what I'm about, what I believe, I should say. What I believe about God, what I believe about His Word, is dictated on so much of how I interact with people in my life. I can't have a freedom to pray, to worship, to take the Lord's Supper, to preach the Word of God. When I know in my heart that somebody and I have a broken relationship, I just want to challenge you at this moment, if there's somebody that you need to write a relationship with. I advise you to stand up right now and go. I mean, that's, that's the thing to do. Jesus said when you come before the altar, you, you, you prepare to offer the sacrifice. And in your heart, you know there's someone, a brother or a sister who has gone against you. Leave it. Go write that relationship and then return. Purity of heart. So important. Father, I just pray for these that are examining themselves right now, God. shared any more about that. What needs to be done is the work of the Holy Spirit. And God, you, you're the only one that's capable of doing that. You're the only capable of, of convicting the heart. God, as we prepare ourselves to take this Lord's Supper, I pray, God, that you would just speak to our very souls. salvation that has brought, been brought to us in and through the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to take this Lord's Supper with brokenness and openness to what you're doing in our lives. We ask it in your name. transition over here to the table. I'm going to invite our uh, back row to start. And what you're going to do is you're going to come by here and get the elements, um, the bread, and also the cup. 
And then if you would, just return right back to your chairs. And uh, we'll do that just starting with the, first, the back row first. Make your way down. And then we'll make our way around into a uh, kind of like a spiral back there.
And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. It says, and also in the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, and I want to ask, Chris, would you pray for the cup, please?
Or you can come up and tell me. But I would really prefer you grab one of these right here and, and let me know what service you would like to attend. The early or the late? Because this is the thing. If we have an early service and everybody wants to go to the early service, what have we gained? We still have a 16.9 ounce bottle. This doesn't change. But what I need to know is, is if everybody signs up and goes to the late or the early, I'm going to have to go to people and say, hey, listen, can you give me a little flexibility and you show up at the other service if we overload one of them? So choose wisely and be honest, huh? The times, right now, the times that we're looking at are 9 a.m. for the early service. Giving ourselves an hour and some change to transition, then we will start, what do we say the second service, Chris? 10.45. 10.45 will be the second service. So 9 and 10.45. Um, and so, if you want to go, if you like sleeping in, 1045 is your baby. If you like getting up early and getting here, 9 o'clock is your friend. Um, and so, we're working out the children's ministry portion of that. Those things will become, you know, we're, we got team meetings this week. Um, actually, we got team meetings coming up to tomorrow or Tuesday. And we have a meeting Thursday. I think it's Tuesday and Thursday on our team meetings for First Look and for 252. You know who you are. And uh, so please just hand it to me if you want to fill out one of these. I, I would like it that if you call yourself either a member or a regular attender. Now, if you're a first-time guest and you may not come back, I understand that. We, uh, I, 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 if this is not your place of worship, then find a place. But if this is your place of worship and you consider this home, please fill this out and give it to me so that I can make an educated decision on, on how our services are going. We did not do this for Easter. And we jammed one service completely full and the second service was like completely empty. Now, the second service people didn't mind it because they were laying on the chairs. <laughs> they had a great time. But the first service people were kind of in here like, oh, you got like that always the sardines. And so if you would, please, um, please let me know that. Now, I'm going to bless the meal, pray for the blessing of the meal. And then you guys are more than welcome to, to head outside. Uh, I look at, I've seen smoke arising from the tent area, so that means hot dogs are quickly on the cook, but uh, I would also welcome anyone who would like to carry chairs out, and uh, we have the tables that are going to be going out as well, and uh, but let's pray for the food, and God just bless that, and then you are dismissed. Father, thank you so much, God, for this service. Thank you for the time that we can come together and fellowship and hang out. Thank you, God, for your Son, Jesus Christ who defines us, who makes us the people that we are, and who draws us together in the oneness that is in Him. One body, one Lord, one baptism. We are one in Christ Jesus. Help us to enjoy that oneness in that community. And we ask in Your name, Amen. God bless. Have a wonderful week. Here we go.
So in all of your ways, acknowledge Him.